Sean's gonna cover me tomorrow so I can be home when the crib is delivered. Jessica? Hey, hey.
tried so hard to see it Took me so long to believe it That you choose someone like me To carry your victory Perfection could never earn it You give what we don't
sing it out. Come on. Giants. Giants fall. Every battle you won. I am. I am who you say I am. You crown me. You crown me. In the heavenly place. Under, by the power. Come on. By the power of your name. I am seen in heaven. In the under the with the one who has conquered it all. Who is USAA made for? It's made for him, a veteran who honorably served. All right, good morning, everybody. Sorry, checking my messages, getting ready to roll, just like most of you on your phones. So let's have a seat. Let's get started today because we got a lot of things to cover. So first off, 10th grade guys, 10th grade guys, I want to draw your attention today. If you'll look at this guy closing the door to my left, to your right, Philip, raise your hand, please. Meet that guy at 10 Roof Barbecue as soon as church service lets out for the third service. Uh, for those of you that were in first service, you know that today is a different kind of Sunday morning service, but a much needed service for the life of our church. Uh, so, hold on. If you are a 10th grade guy, you guys have 10 Roof Barbecue Social today. I want to make sure you know about that. Sophomore girls, this Saturday, 5 p.m., you have your social, all sophomore girls in the Joseph, Elisa Joseph's group. You can see it. There's the address. It is on our app. You have your social, pumpkins, oh, pie, uh, pumpkins and pie, oh, my. And then also ninth grade girls, next Sunday, you have your social right after church. Grab lunch and go to the Groves Hearth area, which is where I live. So it is a beautiful place. It's right there across from Westlake Middle School or the Groves Elementary. And lastly, guys, seventh and eighth grade guys, uh, all middle school boys, you have your bonfire, not this, uh, actually, it is this Friday, yes. This Friday night, you have bonfire right here at the church. You may or may not play Romans and Christians that night, and you may or may not be terrorized by a guy with a sniper, airsoft sniper thing. Per, so, for those who went last year, you know what it is. For the new seventh grade students, you got to come and find out what kind of experience that is. To, it's going to get fun. Not, it's going to get fun. All right. Last announcement I have for you. On your way out, you will receive one of these handouts. All right, on the way out, you'll receive one of these handouts. This is just upcoming events. Next Sunday for all students, next Sunday for all students, we're going to have our first official turkey bowl. We'll meet at the Eagle Springs Park. It's part of our play, park play day, regular park play day events. And we will be playing football in various forms, guys and girls all together. We may or may not be playing with an eight-pound turkey. We will find out when you come out on Sunday for Park Play Day for Turkey Bowl. All right. That said, that said, I'm going to jump straight into our lesson today. I'm going to need some interaction with you and some people you're sitting around. Uh, so we will be interacting with each other more than we have the past few Sundays. And on the back end, I have a couple of one really big, 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 big announcement to make in light of next Sunday. So let's jump into it. Open up your Bibles to the book of Acts. The book of Acts. We're in Acts chapter 5 today. Thank you to Rusty and Peniel for teaching the last few weeks. Kirk Vaughn's going to be teaching over the next couple weeks. 
And uh, Lord willing, Lord willing, he will be Mr. School Board Member, sir, to all of you. <laughs> and we will pray over Kirk before he leaves today and before we dismiss because we want to make sure the Lord would have favor on him for that. Acts chapter 5, cha- uh, verse 12 through... We're going to go quite a bit of passages on here. If you're online, I hope you're watching us. I hope you're engaging. Right now, Jennifer Woolley is online with you so she can engage with you. Drop your name in the comment section so she knows who's watching. Uh, But hopefully you also have your Bible with us or with you so you can join in reading with us because we're jumping straight into this to make sure we have enough time. Here we go. Acts chapter 5, verse 12. I love this story, by the way. This is one of my favorite stories in Acts. And I hope, Lord willing, this happens to a lot of you sometime in your lifetime. That's what I'm hoping. When you ask, Pastor Brandon, what do you pray for me whenever? I pray that this happens to you. So let's read, let's find out, and let's see what's going on here in Acts chapter 5, verse 12. Here we go. Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. And they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared to join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid hands on them uh, and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter might come by, or as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Did you catch that? People saw that such an incredible movement of God was happening in such a marvelous way, in a miraculous way, that people were hoping that not even that Peter would talk to them, not even that Peter would merely touch them, that the shadow of Peter would merely fall past them or pass by them and they would be healed. That's pretty crazy. That's pretty creepy too, but it's pretty cool. That if my shadow, if you were saying, I just, just, I just want to be in Brandon's shadow, I just want to be in Pastor Nathan's shadow in order that I might be healed from whatever it is I'm struggling with. Okay, my shadow would have that much power. Not me and myself necessarily, but Christ through me, the spirit filling in me, would be so strong, so great, so magnificent that if I would just walk by you and my shadow would touch you, you would be healed. We don't ever do that today, do we? We don't ever do that today. Nobody ever goes to a concert just hoping that the con- whoever's leading the concert would touch them with their hand or look at them and then they'd go all crazy. We never do that today, do we? Maybe not you in this room because you're not crazy fanatics like that, right? Maybe you don't ever hope that you get an autographed baseball card from Nolan Ryan. Oh, wait, that was me. I did do that. Sorry. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, I loved and longed for an autographed baseball card from Nolan Ryan. I would have traded off my entire baseball collection, and at that point, I had 300 Nolan Ryan baseball cards. Yes, I was a little creepy, okay? I was Facebook stalking him through, ba- through baseball card stalking before Facebook stalking was real. That's just what I did. I stalked Nolan Ryan at everything. It was just the way I was. I liked the way he played. And I had all of these collections. I mean, all I wanted was just an autographed baseball. I was willing to give up all 300 baseball cards just to get his autographed baseball. I never got it. I was bummed. I mean, I got a Bo Jackson, Brett, Saber, Brett Saberhagen. I've got Jim Eisenreich. I've got, uh, 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 who was the other guy that was really good? Frank Thomas. I've gotten a lot of other guys' autographs in the world of baseball, but I've never gotten Nolan Ryan. So if you have it, let me know. Let me know where you live. Let me know where you're hiding it. And if it ever disappears, don't ask me. If you're online and you're watching this and you're like, hey, I'm going to do something special for Brandon, give me a Nolan Ryan autographed baseball. That'd be cool. All right, moving on. We don't do crazy stuff like today, but there was this stuff going on then. Verse 17, but. So cool stuff going on, but something bad's about to happen. But the high priest rose up, the religious leaders of the time, and all who were with him, that is the party of the Sadducees, the religious group of the time, and they were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public prison. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. Now when the high priest came in and those who were with him, they called together the council, all the senate, and all the people of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. So they were hoping that the religious leaders who had their prisoners, they were going to bring the prisoners to them so they could counsel them, or excuse me, uh, uh, arrest, or excuse me, 
questioned them for the activities that they were doing. But when the officers came, they did not find them in the prison, so they returned and reported. And they said this, We found the prison securely locked and the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. Did you catch that? The prisoners walked past the prison doors and the guards, and no one noticed them. All because of miraculous work of God, having blinded them or whatever else he did, however he chose to do it. But what we know is this, that the prisoners didn't even know the prisoners were gone. That's pretty cool. Kind of like a movie-like scenario, right? You can make a movie about this. Check out what happens. Verse 24. Now when the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them, wondering what this, what this would come to. And someone came to him and told them, look, look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. This was the very thing they arrested them for, and they're out doing it again. Then verse 26, then the captain with the officers went and brought them, but not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. The religious leaders were afraid of what would happen to them if they would bring them by force. Verse 27, and when they brought them, they set before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, we strictly charge you not to teach in this name. Really, they can't even say Jesus' name, but that's what they're saying. We charge you not to teach in Jesus' name. Yet, here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than man. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging on the tree. God exalted him at the right hand as his leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses. There's that word that we keep hearing time and time and time again in Acts. And we are his witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. When they, the religious leaders, heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee in the council, I don't know how to say his name, we're going to call him Captain G. When Captain G, a teacher of the law, held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. So he comes in, he's like, all right, calm down, people. Hey, you, you prisoners, go outside for a moment. Let me talk to these religious leaders. And he said to them, men of Israel, take care what you are about to do with these men. For before these days, Thaddeus rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed, and came nothing to, and nothing came of it. Verse 37, and after him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away, not the same Judas that you remember it was with Jesus, but after, Jesus, after him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people uh, after him. He too perished. And all who followed him were scattered. So, in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them be alone. For if this plan of, the, of theirs, or the, if, for if this plan or this undertaking is of man, catch that phrase, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might, be, you might even be found opposing God. So the religious leaders took his advice, and when they had called the apostles, they beat them and then charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name of Jesus. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that Christ is Jesus. This is an incredible story that we hear in Acts. So here's what I want to do. Uh, We haven't done this before, but we're going to do it now. In the little pockets that you're sitting out with two or three people, not like 10 or 20 of you, with two or three of you, I want you to get together. I want you to look back over the text. I want you to read back over it. I want you to give me three things that stand out to you. All right? So it's going to be talking, it's going to be loud, it's okay, but where you're sitting, two or three of you just circle up together, you can kind of move your chairs a little bit, but I want you to read back through the text, I want you to give me three things that stand out in the text to you. Three things, ready, set, talk.
for those of you that are online, hey, students in the room, keep going. Don't let me distract you. You keep talking. Talk over me. For those of you guys watching online, I want you to do the same thing. Jennifer's online with you right now. Drop in the comment section some things that you noticed in the text that stood out of you. Maybe just kind of blew your mind. Maybe it was just a what is this question about it. But interact with Jennifer right now. She's right there ready for you. So I want you to drop at least two or three things while you're online at your home. Read over the text. Drop me two or three things that you see in the text that stood out to you. And we'll come together in just a moment. All right. All right. So let's do this now. Anybody willing to share one or two of the things that you and your little group discussed, some things that stood out to you? All right. Give me something. All right. They, they showed off their bruises and their scars and their bloody trail. Yeah, cool, cool. All right. Kylie? They were locked in very, very tight. It was securely locked, and yet they were able to get out. Cool. All right, Lowry? Well, it says that, like, when people just were in weird people, they got killed, like, when they were in the shadow. Yeah. So the whole shadow passing by thing was still cool. Good. Did anybody catch the foreshadowing of that? Did you see what I did there? Actually, probably foreshadowing wouldn't be the appropriate word anyway, but did anybody catch the resemblance or the, some, there's in some story in the Old Testament, we'll get back to it in a second, nobody's hard over there, all right, anybody else, what is something else that stood out to you in there? Mackenzie Jenkins, you've been doing great talking about Acts on your social media page, what is something that stood out to you, because I know you've almost read through all of the book of Acts on your own, so what is something that stood out to you? Absolutely. Good. They rejoiced. All right. Anybody else? Any guys? We had Lowry. He was one boy that shared. Any other guys? Jared? It is the, we, we come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ because the Holy Spirit reveals it to us and then we stay, we remain in that obedience because of the power of the Holy Spirit working within us. Yeah, absolutely. By the power and the glory of God alone, not for us. We're passive in that. 
All right. Anybody else? Thanks, Jared. Emily. You just talked about the simple line that was like, you must obey God rather than man. I think it's just like, it's simple, but at the same time, it's definitely harder than it sounds. Like, we, and then we even talked about the, like, you know, like, you need to fear God more than you fear man. And, like, oftentimes, like, we are scared to share the gospel with people that they think of us and, like, we have to focus on what God wants rather than man. Absolutely. So there in verse 29 when he says, we must obey God rather than man. And notice that was the very first thing that he says in response. We will not obey you, but we will obey, uh, we will not obey you, but we will obey God. Cool. By the way, if anybody doesn't know, we have like a, a not incarnate Christ, but Emily dressed up as Jesus for Halloween. So and here she is talking and seeing it. So anyway, I just went ahead and emailed her. She was on her Instagram page, saw it. She was dressed up as Halloween. So I was like, Emily? So anyway, moving on. Halloween's over. We're time for Christmas songs, right? Yeah! All those in favor of Christmas songs after Halloween, raise your hand. All those in favor of Christmas songs after Thanksgiving, raise your hand. Yeah! You are less spiritual people. Please leave. All right. All right. Anybody else? Anybody else want to share something that stood out to them? Jessica Jordan, share something that stood out to you in the passage. Go for it. Verse 39, verse 38 and 38 and 39. If it's of man, it'll fail. If it's of God, you can't stop it. Absolutely. Good, good point. Good. Anybody else? All right. Emily? Uh, so the people that were in charge of the law usually told them not to, and it charged them to not spread the law before they appeared and were disobeying the laws of the land and the Yeah. Which is a good point. If you actually study the historical context of this, the way that they actually detained the Christians there was done illegally, which is exactly what they did to Jesus. They detained Jesus illegally. So you can just say that as Christ followers, there will be things that will be done to us illegally if we are faithful and obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ and we follow Christ more than we follow man. Man will adapt and change the laws to try to persecute, to try to make us suffer, and we will simply do what they do and rejoice. So good point to that. Their, their trial was done, or at least their detaining was done illegally. All right, cool, cool, good, good. Anything else? One more person. I need a guy. Okay, Victoria. No, you're fine. Go ahead. Good. Verse 28. We strictly charge you not to teach this in his, name, in his name. They wouldn't even say his name on it, right? Good point. Good point. All right. Here's what I want to do now. All right. Here's what I want to do now. I want to go back and I want to highlight a few things because I want you to see these things. Now, in verse 12 through 18, 16, we talked about the shadow. All right. Think about another time in the Bible where there was a shadow that passed by people and something happened to them. Think about it. Amongst your little group. Talk about it. Think about it. Old, oh, get to go back to the Old Testament. Think about it. Hold on. Online, if you, online st students, if you think about it, drop it into the comment box. What do you think? What was an Old Testament story where a shadow-like figure passed by and something happened to people? Old Testament story about it. What was that? You got it. We got it. We got it. Britain's like, I got it. I didn't even need to talk to anybody. <laughs> Emma, you got it? You think? All right. So we'll see how many of you concluded this. If you go back to Egypt, and you go back to the ten plagues, the last of the ten plagues was the angel of death and the Passover. The angel would pass over the house, and if the blood of the lamb was not on the house, then the firstborn would die in that house. Think about that for a second. The same God who is ruler over death is the same God who can bring life and healing. The author here, Luke, as he writes the book of Acts, 
highlights that. Like, it just seems like it's just kind of thrown in there, but it's really significant. The author is trying to tell us, think back to the Old Testament. There was this event in the Old Testament where the shadow of the angel of death would pass over the house and people would die. But now we're talking about the people who merely followed Jesus are so filled with the Holy Spirit that when the shadow would, their shadow would pass over the people, people would be healed. They would start walking if they were lame. They would start seeing if they were blind. They could start talking if they were mute. They could, start, they could have their leprosy healed from them. They would have hope and they would have joy. I just want to point that out to you because while that doesn't fit into the overall points of what we're going to try to discuss today, it is important for you to see the significance of our God who does this in the Old Testament, but at the same time does this in the New Testament. It's the same God, the giver of life, the ruler over death, and the giver to life. So now let's jump into this. Uh, okay, it's going to do entry that way. All right, cool. Here we go. So we have the background of the kingdom of God is a grassroots startup. The people were starting, now listen, listen. When the kingdom of God was starting up, it wasn't starting with the high elected officials. The, the Peter and the apostles didn't go to the government officials and say, hey, you need to hear about Jesus. No, they started with the ground roots, the grassroots of people, the lowest of people in there. And there's a significance to that. Another thing that we see in the background of this, the church is growing like a wildfire. You actually see, based on what the uh, Captain G said, was that, listen, if this is a man, it's going to fall off. But if it's of God, what's going to happen? You can't stop it. You can't stop a wildfire. You can try to contain it, but it's going to consume what is in its path. It's going to take out what it's going to take out. You cannot prevent that. We see that happening. In addition to this, we see that now that the movement of God has been, or the mission of God has been moving amongst the people in Jerusalem, we now see that the Romans or the officials, the religious officials, are starting to take note of it. That's why they're persecuting. That's why they're going after the Christians. There's this uneasiness and unrest, and it's starting from the grassroots, and the religious leaders know that those are the people that they want to suppress. Those are the people they want to control, because if they can suppress them and control them from a religious perspective, those individuals have to keep coming to the religious leaders for dependency. They cannot do things on their own. Does that sound familiar to today's politics? But that side, moving on. When the religious leaders and officials start taking notice of this, and lastly, the back on this Christian leaders are being beaten and imprisoned not has the movement has gone from starting at the house it went to the day at Pentecost now it has moved amongst the grassroots of people amongst the city of Jerusalem the religious leaders start taking note of it and they start taking and imprisoning they want to silence the people speaking the name of Jesus and all in hopes that they can maintain control over the people in the city lastly all Christians feel the prosecution the prosecution that's supposed to say persecution my bad but the Christians start feeling the persecution their jobs start becoming in jeopardy now their jobs start becoming in jeopardy their social life starts getting uprooted people start going around to the social networks that the christians would talk to and be like do you know this person they would hold up a little tablet that had the face chiseled out on the christian that they were seeking and they would say do you know this person and if you do, then there would be repercussions to it. People would start ratting each other out. They would start snitching on each other to say, no, 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 no. They're in the next house out. And the people, the Roman officials, would start trying to figure out, all right, when do they meet? The religious officials wanted to find them. They wanted to take their property. They wanted to come after their job, seize their money, pay them more taxes. Whenever that person would come into, that Christ follower would come into the temple to pay their sacrifice to the Lord, they would make that person pay more. The religious leaders wanted to take them and hold the control over them. What we see here, in addition to this, we see that God's mission here in Acts chapter 5, verses 12 through 41, we see that first off, God's mission is to enrich the poor in spirit. The poor in spirit were those that were coming out to the streets. They went to the religious leaders and they weren't getting the hope that they wanted. They weren't getting the healing that they desired. They were not getting the religious questions asked that they, would be, they were asking. And so the religious people, or excuse me, the people would come out poor in spirit out to the streets just hoping, just hoping, clinging to the mere shadow of the apostles. They were poor in spirit. God's mission in this text we see was to enrich them, to give them the blessings and the richness that they so longed for because he knew that they were poor in spirit. In addition to that, we see God's mission is to enrage the prideful. One of the things that we fail to remember to see is that Jesus said, I have come to separate. We know that Christ has come to separate our sin 
as the scripture says, as far as the east is from the west, but we also know this, Christ said that if people would follow him, moms and sons would be separated. We know this. We also know this, that the prideful would be separated from the meek and the humble, or in Christ's own words, the prideful would be separated from the poor in spirit, and the poor in the spirit, those are the ones that Christ would lift up and enrich and give the kingdom of heaven to. We see this, the religious leaders were the prideful ones. We also see this, God's mission here in this text was to energize the mission. He knew his people were going to be suffering persecution. And how they energize the mission is really cool. We're actually going to come back to that in just a second. So look at this, poor in the movement, people's movement in this. We see that there was the poor in the spirit, according to what Christ talked about in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, that blessed are those that are poor in spirit, for they will inherit the kingdom of God. And we see this, there's different aspects of this. We see that Christ came and he gave the poor in spirit physical healing. Those are the people coming out to the streets that we read about, just getting a mere shadow to pass over them. We see that there was spiritual freedom, that the people who were oppressed by the religious leaders of the time came out to hear the name of Jesus, and upon professing faith in Jesus Christ, they were liberated from the religious oppression that they had, and they were free in Christ. They were free in Christ. There was religious freedom for them. There was demonic liberation. In fact, did you know this? All too often, we as Christians try to shy away from this subject matter and this conversation about demonic presence, demonic influence, demonic possession. In fact, there are three different types of demonic things in our world today. There are, in fact, one of those is actually present right here, right now. Did you know that? I can guarantee you that one of the three demonic presences is here right now. There's demonic influence that each and every one of us are under the influence of demonic activities that lure us away from the things of Christ, that's always present. It's some of you, it's in your hearts right now. That even as you sit here and think, you're not thinking about the things of Christ and the things of the word or the things of the spirit, but you're thinking about the things of the world. You are under demonic influence. Second type of thing that is in the demonic things is there's the demonic, uh, excuse me, demonic, uh, there's demonic presence Influence, demonic presence. Uh, So the demonic influence and there's demonic presence. The demonic presence is the actual physical activity around you that is demonic. It goes beyond just merely influencing to lure you away from the things of Christ. Now it begins to draw you in that you might actually engage in the things opposite of Christ. Demonic presence. When you walk through your schools, I guarantee you there is demonic presence in the school. Guarantee it. If a school has a Wiccan principal, there is a demonic presence through them. Wherever there is not the Christ's kingdom established and Christ worship, guess what's present? Demonic presence. If you want to go over to seas to unreached, unengaged people groups where they do not have the gospel of Jesus Christ, they've never heard the name of Jesus, guess what's present? Demonic presence. And then there's the third thing, demonic possession. While odds are many of you, unfortunately, in your lifetime may not ever experience that in a manifestation of a demonic presence, excuse me, a demonic possession, it is real. And I hate to say this, but unfortunately, in our culture today and age, we have something as Christians that we shy away from instead of running to. After all, if you knew that someone was demonically possessed, why would you run away from them? You have the secret. You know the person who can liberate them, and yet you run from them instead of running to them. And I know where this happens because it happens every single day in your schools. It happens every single day in your schools. There is guaranteeing you somebody in your school that is demonically possessed. And yet you do is this. Put your blinders on, put your head down, and just go. You don't want to ignore it. You don't want to be a part of it. It's scary. But did you know that you want at one point were demonically influenced, demonically, you were in the demonic presence, and you were demonically possessed. Did you know that? 
Because at one point, you rejected the authority of God yourself. But upon the Holy Spirit speaking into your life, pulling the scales off your eyes, allowing you to see who Christ is, you rejected the demonic presence. You rejected everything associated with the demonic activity and said, I will flee from that. I will rid myself of my sin, not on my own power, own accord, but because of Christ in me who did it for me on the cross. And by my faith in him, my sins are washed away and no longer bound by the religious or demonic presence and activity. Instead, I'm freed from that. And now I can walk in the power in the name of the Holy Spirit, the power in the name of Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. Why would you not want others to have that? Why would you not want others who are experiencing demonic influence, demonic presence, or demonic possession, why would you not want them to experience the liberty that you have in Christ? We see that, though. It's happening here. We see that this is the people, that as the people are movement, moving, as God is moving amongst them, and as they're moving to obey God, they're running towards this. They're like, hey, here's another guy who's demonically oppressed. Let's lay hands on him. Hey, here's a guy who's sick. Let's, let's put hands on him. Hey, here's some poor people, poor in spirit. They're desperately wanting to get out of, away from the religious oppression. Let's run to them. Now, catch this. Please catch this. You can be poor in the spirit and be rich in money. That's okay. You can be poor in the spirit, but yet be rich in money. You can also be really rich in money, really rich in friends, really rich in health, really rich in social life, and be, not be poor in the spirit. But Christ didn't say, I'm going to fix you and give you wealth and health and all these things. He said, no, I want to fix your spirit. For those of you that are, I'm not going to take away from Pastor Nathan's thunder. He actually stole this like right out of my text today, which is kind of crazy. It's just how the Holy Spirit's working amongst our church right now. Pastor Nathan's going to talk more about this in, this, in his sermon and in, in the prayer meeting that he's going to do for those that haven't gone to it, but during the third service. So I'm not going to get much into this, but let me tell you this. Christ is about fixing your spirit before he's about fixing anything else in your life. We see this. For those who were poor in the spirit, who came to Christ in faith, guess what? He healed them. For those who were poor in the spirit and came to Christ seeking spiritual freedom, he freed them. For those who were demonically possessed and they came to Christ and poor in the spirit, he liberated them. That's the movement that's going on. So just a quick question on this. When was the last time you saw these things happen in your lifetime? When was the last time that you, a teenager, went up to somebody in school And said, listen, I know you're really struggling in life. I'm not trying to be prideful or arrogant on this, but I feel what you're going through. Hey, can I just pray for you right now? Or were you like, I don't know what they're going to think of me. They're going to think of me really weird. They're going to think of me really like strange, creepy. They're going to think of me as I'm just some sort of religious freak that's just trying to run around thinking I'm better than all of them. Who cares? Or they're going to go talk about me on the sports team or the inquire. They're going to call me that religious person. Who cares? I'm just going to share this story real quick. One of the best things I did to make Christ known in my school at the time was me and my best friend on the baseball team. Every single game from my sophomore, junior, and senior year because we both got moved up to varsity our sophomore years. He and I, every single game, would invite the entire team to come and pray with us before the game. Not everybody did all the time. Matter of fact, most of the time, it was just me and Loopy. But we'd go off to the side. We would pray before every single game. We didn't go out to the mound. We didn't go out in the public. We'd just go off to the bullpen area. We'd walk down together. We would pray, Lord, we don't pray for victory, but we pray for your glory. Win or loss, may we just give you the glory in all things. May our attitude reflect that of Christ and that of a good teammate. Lord, may you give us the opportunity, either in the game or after the game, to share what we believe about you with our teammates. That's what we prayed every single time. We did get made fun of. We did get made fun of. You know, matter of fact, years later, I found out the reason why a lot of people would never invite me to the parties, especially guys on the baseball team, because they would say, well, you were the religious guy. We didn't want to invite you. We were afraid you would ruin it. Yeah. That's how I felt. (laughs) Yeah, that's what my life was like. I was cool with that because my legacy with them, my, my testimony to them, my witness for Christ stood well beyond just my baseball career. Who cares? I went and did that. 
What are you doing? What are you afraid of? Because these things can happen if you are walking in faith in Christ. Now watch this. What did you come to Christ with and what do you come to Christ with? Check this out. When, when the people of the, the book of Acts would come to Christ, they did not come to Christ based on physical needs that they wanted. They came to Christ not based on, excuse me, they did not come to Christ based on social needs or mar- marital needs. They came to Christ based off of spiritual needs needs. These things were the evidence or the outflow of their spiritual needs. They needed Christ in their lives. They needed the filling of the Holy Spirit in their lives. And that was the outflow of those things. But all too often, people come to Christ because they're afraid of hell. Let me tell you this. Let me tell you this. There are a lot of people who are not going to heaven, but they're afraid of hell. Heaven is not reserved for people who are afraid of uh, hell. Heaven is reserved simply and purely for people who love God. You can hate hell, you can be afraid of hell, but you're not going to love God. Some people come to faith in Christ because they're afraid of hell, but they never grow in their faith in Christ because they didn't come to Christ with their actual spiritual needs. They just came to Christ out of their fears. Some people come to Christ because it's their lowest point. You've heard this say, I don't want to be Christian because I don't want to have a crutch to have to lean on onto all the time. You know what? Some people do come to Christ because they're like, I need a crutch to lean on just to get me through hard times. And Christ is like, what are you kidding me? I didn't die on the cross for you to just use me as a crutch. I died on the cross so I could have all of your life. Forget the crutch. You don't need that anymore because you need me to fill every part of who you are, your veins, your oxygen, your lungs, your brain, every part of who you are. You need me in all of you. You don't need me as a crutch. You need me in every part of your life. But some people came to Christ with that type of mentality. So I asked the question, what did you come to Christ with? And I ask the question, what do you come to Christ with? What are the prayer things that you bring before the Lord? Lord, heal my dog. Remember my first time in student ministry, I was a teaching eighth grade boys, a bunch of punks. There were about 30 of them sitting in one little room that was about the size of that closet that's back there. I've shared this story before. You could smell them before you got anywhere near them. The room just permeated and just, it just overflowed with their stench. The stench was just oh, too much body axe on. I walked in there and after walking with them, I kind of started sensing this continual repetitive thing. Each one of them would pray for their dead dog. I was like, all right, you guys are funny, a bunch of eighth grade punks. But we had to have a sit there meeting with them. I was like, listen, guys. First of all, the movie lied to you. All dogs don't go to heaven. They go to hell. That's where they belong. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> now we know for, hey, I'm just kidding. We know that all cats go to hell. Okay, all right. No. All of the animal lovers, please, please listen to me. Side note, Okay. We don't know where they go, but we know they don't have souls, so I really don't care, okay? But we do know this, new heaven on earth, will there be animals? More than likely, yes, because there were animals in the Garden of Eden. So we can sit there and say that, yes, there are likely animals, but is it your dead dog that goes to heaven? No. He has no soul he's done with, or she's done with. Your cats, they're done with, okay? But after all, would you really want Fido to be with you in heaven? No. Do I really want Tucker, my, our little kavapoo with us in heaven? No. He would ruin it because that dog is the most annoying, clingy dog that there is. Eats underwear and socks all the time. You go through the wash machine, you pull out your clothes, you put them in the dryer, you put them in there and you're like, I can't stick my head through the underwear now. I'm like, thanks, Tucker. Do not want that dog in heaven. Anyway, anyway. Sh- What do you come to Christ with now? Do you come to him to to take care of your physical healing? Well, that's not opposed. But do you primarily come to him for your spiritual healing? What good is if you come to the only person who can take care of your spiritual needs, but you never come to him with your spiritual needs, you only come to him with your physical, emotional, and social needs? He's like, you want to take care of your social needs? Let's take care of your spiritual needs first. You want to take care of your physical needs? Let's take care of your spiritual needs first. You want to take care of any other needs that you have that's not related to spiritual? We can take care of that. Let's take care of the spiritual needs first. You need me. You need to be dependent on me. 
When was the last time that you prayed such a way that it was like, if you do not stop praying, or excuse me, if you, when was the last time you prayed in such a way that if you stopped praying, you knew that it would end? That's how we should pray. Because in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, it says, pray without ceasing. We should pray so relentlessly and so passionately and so fervently that we're always doing it, thinking about what we need to pray for. Lord, I am praying for this student's lost soul. Lord Jesus, I'm walking through my schools. Give me eyes, spiritual eyes, to see the hurting and the poor in spirit who do not know you. Lord Jesus, give me eyes, the Holy Spirit, give me eyes to see demonic activity and presence and possession in our schools. Lord Jesus, give me the spiritual feeling to have the courage to go and boldly speak and pray or lay hands on the person who is hurting in my school. And I won't stop, Lord, until you show me. I will go all day, all week, all month, all semester, all year until you show me who I need to pray for. What kind of things do you come to Christ with? Keep moving on. We also see this, the prideful were engaged, enraged. There is the intellectual pride, social pride, family pride, and moral pride, all evidence in this scripture. We see that the intellectual pride in the religious leaders of we are smarter than the poor in spirit. Let us continue to have dominion over them. And it's not different than some of you guys and girls sitting in here right now. I'm so smart, I can reason God out. Good luck on that. That's why he keeps coming back to you and showing you new things. That's why you keep having to create new ways and new methods to try to reason him out because you're just so intellectual. No, you're just prideful in an intellectual sense. Social pride. I have all the friends I need. Everybody likes me. People know me. I'm good. People will come up to me and talk to me. Great, but is that social pride in your life? Is that preventing you from coming to Jesus? Because if you're unwilling to let go of those people, then for that reason, you're unwilling to come to Christ. You're not poor in spirit. You may be rich in friends, but in reality, you'll also get rich in hell. Third thing, family pride. Unwilling to let go of family. Your family, your parents come before Christ. No, you're obedient to parents because you're obedient to Christ first. Last thing, moral pride. We see this in religious Peter's people all the time. We saw it in the religious leaders in this text. These are four things that prevent you from growing in your faith, and these are four things that prevent your friends from coming to faith. Maybe it's preventing you right now from coming to faith. Maybe the social pride is preventing you from being baptized today. Maybe you've never been baptized, and you've intellectually reasoned, I'm a good person, I'm all right. You've morally have pride in yourself, saying, I'm a good person, I'm walking, I'm following God, but you've never followed him in obedience and point of baptism. Moral pride. I know that firsthand in my life. I've shared with you my story. Maybe it's family pride. Well, my family's a different faith, or my family is a different religion, or maybe I was baptized when I was little, but I know I never made a profession of faith before then, but my family would be upset if I was baptized. Family pride. Put it aside. Be baptized today. But what do my parents think that I've grown up in the church all of my life? What would they think that if now all of a sudden I say that I'm going to be a Christian, what will they think of me? Family pride. Who cares? It's what Christ thinks. Put the pride away. Come to faith in Christ today. Be baptized today. We see this amongst the movement people. We see that the humble, those who were poor, they were humbled. They were wanting more. They could never get enough of Jesus. We see that they were obviously freed from prison and they boldly shared their gospel. So there was the pride, people of pride, they were moved to do these things and they were bit, uh, enraged and they were uh, just in, uh, anchoring down into these pride issues. But the humble, Christ freed them. And in the humble, they continue to share the gospel. So come to this last point. I'm just going to put it all up there because of time's sake. The energized mission. We see, and you guys pointed out, they were rejoiced. And again, I say rejoice based on Philippians 4. We keep rejoicing on this. We don't stop believing you know you wanted to sing the song, right? How many of you did? Raise your hand, please. Don't stop. Believe. Okay, moving on. All right. Third thing that we see amongst the medium of people in the energized mission, they shared with one another because the mission can't be stopped. Here's what I want to challenge you guys to do tonight, and we're going to do this right now. We're going to do this right now. If we want to be an acts-like church, 
if we want to see that we call it the early church simply because it was early on, but that doesn't separate us from the same movement and the same God that moved in that time. It doesn't forsake, separate us from doing the same thing that the early church did. We can do the same thing. So who is someone at your school who is poor in spirit? Who is it? Put them in your mind's eye right now. I want to also challenge you, who is someone in your school, it may be the same person, who is someone in your school that you know you can go up to tomorrow and say, hey, listen, can I just pray with you? They're going to be like, why? Well, because I believe in who Christ is. I know what Christ has done in my life. The Holy Spirit has revealed this to me, that I and my need for Christ has empowered me, has freed me, and has given me a completely different life prior to when I was rejecting Christ. And I don't know where you are, I don't know if you believe, I don't know, but I, can I just pray for you to my God? Maybe it's a demonically possessed person in your school. Maybe it's a demonically influenced person. Maybe it's a demonic presence. I don't know. You know. Who is someone that you know in your school is poor in spirit and who is someone that you can pray for tomorrow? The other part, are you in the pride group or the humble group? If you're in the pride group and baptism is what's holding you up, come on, let's go. We got two people today. Can is there a third, a fourth, or a fifth? Many before you who have already stepped away from that pride to be baptized. I know, like I said in my own life, I lived in pride from my sixth grade year to my junior year and finally let go of it and was baptized. Doesn't mean I wasn't saved prior to that. I was just living in that pride. I was scared to get in front of people. And I know some of you just the last few months, few months or a few weeks ago, I know one of our students who was terrified of going underwater. But that student let go of that fear let go of that pride, and they were baptized. And it was an incredible opportunity to be able to baptize them. The third thing, what is one story you can share about your faith at school to encourage others? Students, I don't want this to be a room that when you come in every single Sunday, the first thing that you always want to talk about and that dominates your conversation is how your week was in sports, how your week was with friends, how, your week, how bad your week was in school. I don't want that. Although that's cool, that's great. If the first thing you don't share about when you come into this room is what did Christ do in your life, then what are we doing? I don't want to be like every other student ministry where we just sit there and tell stories about our lives and our struggles and all this other stuff. I want to be a student ministry separated and different than others that when we walk in and a guest walks in and goes, wait a minute, wait, you're telling a story to him about someone you shared the faith with this week? You're sharing a story about someone you laid hands on and they were demonically freed from the spirit? A demonic spirit? You're, you're, wait a minute, you're, what, like, where, are, where am I? What is this? Is this a church, right? Yeah. Is this a student ministry? Yeah. But you're teenagers. Yeah who love Jesus. And Christ dominates our conversations. We are not content in just segregate, segregating what Christ does here to here and not there. We want to see what Christ does here and there, meaning like AHS, Summer Creek High School, and all the other 29 schools that you guys represent. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to spend the last few minutes. I want to challenge you. One of these three things, in the group that you were in with right there in a moment ago, Discuss one of these three things. Who is someone that you can pray for? Are you in the pride group or humble group? And then what is someone, a story that has gone on this past week at school that you can share with others to encourage them? Because that's what the disciples did. Something bad happened to them. They shared stories about the incredible movement of God. It motivated them, energized them that they could go off and do more. So groups of three or four right now, two to three, three to four, amongst one another, talk about these three things. Three minutes, go.
students in the room keep talking. Students online, students in the room, keep talking. Keep chit-chatting. Students online, I want to give you that same challenge. Jennifer, again, is online waiting for you. I want you to drop a story, maybe just a quick bullet point story about something that Christ has been doing in your life at your school. Drop it in there so Jennifer can share it with me and share it with the students later on. Or maybe it's someone you can pray for. Put their first name in the comment section. Or maybe the uh, thing is, is maybe you're sitting at home and online and you want to be baptized. Put your name in there, hyphen, I want to be baptized. That way I can get with Jennifer and we can set it up. In fact, if you are watching online right now, you can be baptized today. There's still time to come up to the church. We got all the clothes for you. Tell your mom and dad, let's jump in the car so that way you can come and be baptized today. But let us know if you're coming. Just talk to Jennifer, drop a comment, drop her name in the comments and say, I want to be baptized. So drop, interact with uh, uh, Jennifer and students on, in person. We'll get going in just a second. All right. All right. Now here's the deal. Unfortunately, it is now 11.15. Now, that's unfortunately, but fortunately, Pastor Nathan's going really, really long today. So we got a little extra time, okay? <laughs> uh, Pastor Nathan sent us the, uh, this, the service outline for today, and we all laughed at him, and he goes, you want to do this in 60 minutes? He's like, yeah. I'm like, no, not going to happen. So it was like, you try to preach in 45 minutes, that doesn't happen. But here's the thing with it. As much teaching of the Word of God as we can have, we will take, because that is the evidence of Christ with us, is the evidence of us making much of Christ and the Holy Spirit being with us. So Pastor Nathan's going a little long-winded, but here, let me talk to this reality. It is 1115, which means that our 60 minutes would normally be up. Okay but not anymore. Not anymore. Starting next Sunday, we will no longer be meeting for merely 60 minutes. It has been a very difficult task to try to get into 60 minutes lesson, interaction, and small group discussion. But starting next Sunday, we will now have 75, 70 to 75 minutes to get in interaction, the lesson, and get our small group discussions in. Because this would be the time that we would start small group discussions and we would have 15 minutes to do it. But we haven't been able to do that. But next Sunday, it changes. So hear me on this. Pastor Nathan made an announcement. You can go to our YouTube channel. If you're online watching and you don't know what's going on, uh, you can go to our YouTube channel. In fact, where you are, you can see Pastor Nathan's address to the parents of students and students from just this past Tuesday night. Starting next Sunday, we no longer will have three services. That's gone. It's gone, okay? But we will have, you like that magic? Two services now, okay? So we will no longer have three services. We will have two. Now let me walk you through this and what that means for you, okay? Wherever your parents go to life group, their life group leaders right now are telling them, either last life group or this life group, they are telling your parents which life, which service that they will be going to and which time they'll be meeting. So they either go to, go to service at 9 or 10.30 and then the opposite service time, they go to life group. So here's what that means specifically for you. Whenever your parents go to life group, you go to life group. So if your parents go to 9 o'clock life group, you're going to come to 9 o'clock student life group. If your parents go to 10.30 life group, you're going to come to 10.30 student life group. And here's the thing, because we'll be there will be a, a multiplication of our ministry into both of these times. That means you guys are going to be, for the most part, put in half, just about. Now, let me talk to this real quick. Because the first reaction is, oh, man. Listen, if your whole social life is centered around 75 minutes a week to somebody, that's lame. Okay? If your entire week is contingent upon being with one person for 75 minutes in the week, find a new friend, okay? Okay? I mean, I'm just saying. But listen. Shh. Listen. So inevitably, some of you guys are going to be in different ones. That's on your parents, not me. So if you're mad about it, go talk to your parents, not me, okay? 
All right, that's not on me. I'm just doing what, what we have to do for the sake of the church. Here's the deal, though. Because we'll be a smaller group overall, there will be about 60 to 70 in each group as opposed to 120 in one group. Okay, 120, 130 in one group. We'll now get Babel to meet in small group sections again. Okay, so next Sunday we'll come in. Now, here's how this looks. If you come to 9 o'clock Life Group next Sunday, you will meet your new or your current small group leader. You'll actually sit down and have interaction with them, okay? Afterwards, we'll have a 15-minute overlap. We'll have breakfast provided for everybody that's come to the 9 o'clock life group, and we'll have breakfast for everybody coming for the 1030 life group. That way, when you cross over with each other, you'll have a chance to interact and hang out and talk and things like that, okay? And then we'll have our 1030 life group while the 9 o'clock life group people go to worship. So we'll still all be together, and we'll all go out to baptisms together as well. So it'll be more of a family unique or family engagement that way. Now, hear me on this. Your socials with your age groups will still happen with your age groups. So just because you're in two different life groups, that doesn't mean that you won't actually still do things with the students from the other life group hour. We will still do things, all 10th grade guys, all 11th grade guys, all those kind of things will still happen. And we still have big events, i.e. next Sunday we have our turkey bowl. All guys, I'm giving you this out. It's not on a sheet yet, but it will be there. The Sunday prior to Thanksgiving, we're going to do our first, first of the school year airsoft thing, okay? So, if you're, everybody can come. Girls can come too, okay? All right. Sure. So, listen. That's a Sunday prior to Thanksgiving. We still have our guys' camp out coming up January 1st and 2nd. We have the girls' night out, which is February 13th. We have M3 weekend planned for April 17th. Uh, and we have camp. So we still have tons of things that we're still going to get to do as a large group, okay? Want to make sure you know that, and then our socials mixed into that. Now, that said, that said, all right, we are going to also next Sunday be really, really emphasizing using our text message group through the student ministry app. So if you don't have the app, please get it. If you don't have the app, ask your parents for it. If you don't have messaging, you'll get group put into it next Sunday with your small group leaders so that you can have constant communication with them and you can get the updates and things that are going on. If you don't have the smartphone, if you don't have that, all this will also be available on the website and we'll send your parents links to that. So that's, that said, if you're online and watching with us and you have any questions about what I just said, Jennifer's on there right now. I'll jump on there and answer any questions that you may have about that. But you can also watch Pastor Nathan's uh, live feed from this past Tuesday night, uh, or excuse me, his recorded feed from Tuesday night about why we're having to do this. So cool times, great times. It's just part of where we're at in the student ministry. That's awesome. All right. That said, let me applaud two groups of students real quick. I'm going to call them out, and they're going, to, they're going to hate me for this, but whatever. As Pastor Nathan said, he's my boss, and as I say, I'm your pastor, so get over it. All right. First two students, I want to applaud Jared Reynolds, and she's downstairs. Campbell Lino have been leading a Bible study at a... Go ahead. What? No. Uh... So they have been started leading a Bible study Monday, to, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at Atascacita High School. It starts at 6.45 to 7.15, uh, just 30 minutes. Meet them at the flagpole outside of Atascacita High School. So if you go to AHS, if you go to AHS, please come join them. May we see a movement. I'm going to share a story next week that's pretty cool about something like that. Second group I want to do, all right? Kenneth Fuquay and McKinley, I'm not going to say her last name because you all hopefully know who she is, my daughter, McKinley Bales, uh, they are doing a prayer meeting on Tuesdays and Friday mornings at Summer Creek High School, okay? So they are leading a prayer meeting at Summer Creek High School. If you go to Summer Creek High School, get up, get up, all right? From like 7.55 to about... Uh, or, uh, 6.55 to 7.15. So it's about 20 minutes worth. You can get there, show up, come. It is, uh, where is it at again? Outside uh, Wilburn's room? Is that right? In Miss Wilburn's room, which is in what hall? Freshman side. What house? Freshman hall, second floor, Miss Wilburn's room. Find it. You can ask Kenna, you can ask McKinley about it. They can tell you which one of your Summer Creek High School students. So, we have those two. 
We have those two groups started up. Who's next? Who is next? In fact, 11th grade girls, before you leave, come see me. Come up here. I want to introduce you to Victoria because she wants to talk to all the 11th grade girls about trying to start up a, a Bible, or excuse me, a prayer group with 11th grade girls. So we have a third one trying to get started up. Who will be fourth, fifth, sixth? And we will not stop until every school has one. Let me pray for you guys, and then you guys are dismissed. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity. Lord, I know it's long. I know it's a lot to listen to. But Lord, it's your word. It is your word being spoken. You are very clear that how can someone come to faith if we do not share the gospel? How can we grow in faith if we do not study your word? And while, Lord, what we discuss here is in the level and applicable to the lives of teenagers right now, it's not as important as what we discuss in the corporate worship of our church family. And, Lord, what you are doing through our church family. It's an incredible thing. May we not be content in being spiritually stagnant because we know that that leads to stench and death. But may we desire and long for your your filling and that through the Holy Spirit's filling, may you do an incredible work greater than you've ever done through this student ministry and through this church family. Lord, while I could visit every single campus every month, I don't want to. I don't want to, Lord. You know my heart. Who am I? I am what one person. But who are these students? They are many. And you have not, without intentionality, brought these students together to represent a student ministry and a local church to represent 20 Nine different schools. You've done it with the intentionality of making your name and your son's kingdom known on each one of those campuses. Two have already started. Third in the works. But may we not be content until all have a physical presence, people praying for others, sharing your truth on a regular basis transcending walls that are built up for the church building, which really don't even exist, really. But we as humans make them. May multiple churches be in on it because we are your kingdom. So Lord, while we may be tired, we may be exhausted, we may be wish for other things, we will not take anything other than your presence with us, your filling within us, and us going to boldly proclaim your good news to each one of the campuses. Lord, I pray that as students leave today after having gone to worship and life group, I pray that they would be filled with your spirit and boldened for you. And for those who are going to go to corporate worship, I pray that your spirit fill them through the prayer meeting. And I pray all these things for the glory of the one who is worthy. In Christ's holy name, amen. Amen. All right, 11th grade girls, if you have a moment, come up here, meet with Victoria for a moment. Everyone else, I love you, but get out of here. If you're online, I do miss miss your face. I hopefully can see you soon. Make sure you check out our student ministry webpage so you can see what upcoming events and that you can join with us. I hope to see you soon. I love you. I miss you. Goodbye. Christ be